Learning to reference manuscript material can be slightly daunting, and a good place to start is a letter, because it has almost all the pieces of information you'll need for any archival source. Unlike a printed publication, when we cite a manuscript, we usually have to get the information from several different sources. In this case, a letter, or a piece of correspondence, will usually derive its information from three different places. The letter itself, the folder or box in which it is stored, and the catalog record of the archive. If you're looking at an electronic source, you'll still need this information, most of which you'll be able to find on the image of the letter and the catalog record, although you may not be able to find the folder or the box, and you will have to add the URL or the website address where you actually saw the document. But for the moment, we're going to be working with photographs I took of a hard copy manuscript at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now this document has three pages. They're actually quite small and hastily written, but fortunately they're just legible enough for me to make out who the letter is to, who the letter is from, and the date it was written. And that's the key information we need from the manuscript itself. We also need the information from the printed label on the folder and the box. Now in this case, the box information is also printed on the folder, so I only took a picture of that. If you're in an archive and taking lots of images, make sure that you always take photographs or at least very careful notes of the different folders, boxes, and collections you're looking at, because this information is normally not included in the catalog record you'll find online. If you don't take it when you're there, you'll not be able to retrieve it again easily. The rest of the information about the particular collection as well as the archive we can find in the library catalog. Most library catalogs and archive catalogs are now available online, so you should be able to get this basic information anywhere in the world. When it comes to creating our footnote and our bibliography entry, just like with most of our other sources, I always suggest doing the footnote first. That way you have a complete list of all the things you've actually cited in the document before you start to put together your final bibliography. So, where do we begin with a footnote of a manuscript letter or piece of correspondence? Well, as you might imagine, we begin with the author or the person who wrote the letter, followed by the recipient or the person who received the letter. We find the name of the correspondent or the person who wrote the letter on the final page, after the valediction or the signing off note, such as sincerely, yours faithfully, best wishes, or ciao. And in this case, the author has chosen not to use their real name, and instead, like many correspondents to newspapers in the 19th century, has given a Greek pseudonym. In this case, the Greek pseudonym they have chosen is Alethes. Now, Alethes is a Greek word for uncensored or truthful. And it's always good to look up what these words mean because it gives you a little insight into the author's mindset. And this just means that it is a truthful letter, honest, earnest, and really ought to be published by the editor. When it comes to the recipient of the letter, we usually find that on the first page after the salutation, dear so-and-so. In this case, however, the letter simply begins with sir. However, at the top of the letter, he does write to the editor of the National Igis. And we happen to know, as I'm sure he did at the time, that the editor of the National Igis at 1858 was William Lincoln. So, after Alethes, we write to William Lincoln. Now, because footnotes are like sentences, we now end this part with a comma. The next bit of information we want to include is the date of the letter. You don't actually need to put that the letter is a letter as opposed to some other form of manuscript. You just need to give the information that a reader will need to use to find it within the collection. So in this case, the letter was written on the 29th of March, 1858. 
Now again, this information is usually in the top right hand side of the first page, but this particular correspondent has scrawled it in the bottom left corner of the last page. You just have to look around and try and find it. If there isn't a date included, either on the manuscript itself or in the notes for the collection, you can include in.d, which is no date. Or if the date is written by the cataloger, usually in pencil, clearly in a different handwriting, you can put that date in square brackets to indicate that you know what the date is, even if it's not given on the letter itself. After we put the date information, we need to include information about where this publication is within the collection. You'll notice, however, that I'm not putting the page number of a particular citation, and that is fine. Like newspaper articles and other short forms, you don't need to put individual pages for manuscript documents. Now, if the document is exceedingly long and has page numbers written, it can be useful to include it, but it's not necessary for something as short as this letter, which we can think of as a single whole document. So where do we find the information about where it is in the collection? We have to turn to the folder or the box label that we found the letter within. Because I went to the archive itself, I was able to take a photograph of this particular folder label, as well as the box in which it was placed. However, this information can also be found in some finding aids that are sometimes available online. Otherwise, you may have to omit this information if you were not able to record it at the time you viewed the document. But if you do have it, and I do suggest you always take careful notes, it's important to include it as a finding aid to other people using this source. So after the date, we put in box one, folder five, and that gives us the precise location of this letter. Now, of course, there were about 20 other letters in this folder, so the person is going to have to leaf through them. But because we have given the date as well as the author and the recipient, they should be able to find it fairly quickly. The final place we find our information is the library catalog itself, and this will give us the information we need on the collection as well as the archive and its location. So if we pull up the catalog record, we find that the name of the collection is the National IGIS Business Records. But we want to put this together in a way that is more readable to the person looking at our essay or our article than maybe the catalog record, which is designed to have as much information as possible so people know what items they might want to retrieve. So the first thing we want to do is to put the author of the collection. And in this case, the author, which is in red as a hyperlink here, is a corporate name, the National IGIS itself. These are the newspaper's business records. If it had been a personal name, you would still put first name first, surname second, like you would for any other sentence or footnote reference. But in this case, we'll put the corporate title, which is National I guess. And we put in the city, Worcester, Mass, because there are very many newspapers called the National I guess, and this just differentiates it. It gives the canonical name of this particular institution. After that, we put a comma, and we put the name of the collection itself. Now, the collection is called the National I guess Worcester, Mass Business Records Manuscript. And we could put all that information in, but we're repeating details, and that's not necessarily best practice. It's just going to obscure the information. So I'm going to write a slightly more truncated or shortened version of this. I'm going to write business records, because we've already included the name of the National IGIS, and then the dates, 1806 to 1891. I didn't include manuscript in brackets because that information is really just for users of the catalog to understand that these are manuscripts rather than formal printed documents. And this is helpful to know because business records could be either, and it gives a little bit of information to someone before they ask it to be accessed. So now that we have the name of the box and the folder and the collection, we need to indicate which archive this collection is held in. 
And this is something that you just have to look at the top of the website or know where you got the document from. And we got it from the American Antiquarian Society, which is located in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, in a lot of cases, I wouldn't put the name of the state or province, but because Worcester is ambiguous, there is a very famous Worcester in Massachusetts and one in England as well, I put Massachusetts just to differentiate it that little bit more. And at this point, we've really completed the citation. We have all the information we need in order to allow people to find our document. If we wanted to be just a little bit more thorough, we could include the call number as well. This would give an indication of where in the archive the item is actually stored. Now, most people who would go look at this collection would simply look it up in the catalog when they arrived because this information might change. And indeed, the collection information here is manuscript box N for National Igis. So that's not really giving a lot of useful information. However, if there are a lot of similarly named collections or document folders, it might be helpful to include the call number as well. Now that we have this particular footnote complete, we can go on to look at the bibliography entry. Now, the bibliography entry is very simple in comparison to some of the other types of citations you'll be working with. Unless you have a single item from a collection, you've only had one item from that entire collection, you normally won't put that first part of the information, the to, the from, the date, the box, in your bibliography. Instead, you'll just cite the entire collection. This is really helpful because it's the collection and not the item that people will usually find in catalogs. And remember, everything about citation is to help people find these documents. So really, the actual citation is something you can cut and paste exactly as it's written in the footnote. So if I take just the collection title onward, and I make sure that this is a hanging indent, as all good bibliographies are, we have the name of the collection, author, National Igis, the name of the collection, Business Records, the name of the archive, American Antiquarian Society, and the name of the location, Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, there is one thing we do have to change, of course. We have to change all of these commas into full stops because a bibliography entry is like a paragraph as opposed to a footnote, which is like a sentence. Make sure you don't change that comma between Worcester and Massachusetts, however, that actually does stay a comma. The only thing that I would say is that this is a corporate title, so you keep the name exactly as it's written in the bibliography. If this had been a human being, however, an individual, like all other bibliography entries, you would put the last name first, followed by a comma, and then the first name second. And there we go. We have a full footnote for a manuscript letter, as well as a bibliography entry for an archival collection. I hope you found this video helpful and it taught you something about why we cite our archival materials the way we do. If you found it useful, please consider hitting the like button below or subscribing to the channel. This will let me know that these are the types of videos you want more of. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to make a suggestion for a future typography video, please put a comment down below.